Today we'll be talking about the creation of man, the creation of man. We are covering different studies within theology. There's the study of Christology, which is the study of Christ. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Ghost. Bibliology, the study of the Bible. This one is from anthropology. You probably heard that in the colleges and the schools you attended. But anthropology simply means the study of man. And in the Word of God, there is much to cover on the study of man. So we will be covering one of the subtopics within this branch of anthropology. And this subtopic is creation of man. If you'll open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. It's not too loud. Okay. Genesis chapter 2, and then uh, we'll look at verse 7. Let's first talk about how God created man, how God created man. Uh, you'll notice from this board that God created man out of the dust of the ground. And we have to realize how important this gender is to God. Now, I know when you hear that, you think, discrimin uh, you think discrimination, you think male chauvinism is stuff like that. The reason why is because of the Bay Area culture that we live in. But you have to realize this, whenever God chooses something, mankind will always hate it, and they'll say that's unfair. So let me repeat that again. Whenever God chooses something for his work or what he wants, if God has his preferences his likes, mankind will always say, well, that's unfair, that's discriminatory. No, everybody has their own likes, their own tastes, their own preferences. If I say I like kimchi more than a burrito, you're not going to accuse me of discrimination. That's just really stupid. Right. Now, God, he chose one nation, the Jewish people. Amen. And that's above any other nation. But people get mad and they said that's discrimination. God choose one way of salvation today, receiving Jesus Christ by faith, not by works. People call that religious discrimination. God chose one sacrifice, one way, one Savior for you to receive to go to heaven. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And people say, well, what about Muhammad? What about Buddha? You think that Jesus is superior, blah, blah, blah. God chose a gender to identify himself with. Okay. Male. All right, he ain't female. He ain't a neuterit. And he ain't inclusive that he's trans something, okay? He's not a monstrosity. He chose a gender that he wants to identify himself with, man. So because that's his gender, we have to understand that when he created man, that's the gender that he chose to be something very special, and that's one of his preferences in creation. It's a male spirit. Now, are you going to call that discriminatory, or are you going to go by God's likes, God's preferences, and submit to that? Look, if uh, God was a woman, or God was a neuterate, or God was something else, then we have to submit to whatever God chose or identified himself with. We can't please everybody. And it's just ridiculous, and you'll have to admit it's ridiculous too, if you live every day where people accuse you of discrimination because you have a preference of how you create things. Okay. Your likes on how you create things. So God has his preferences and his likes on how he creates things. So like it or lump it, that's it. That's just God's way of doing things. If we understand that this is God's preference, a male gender, then it's going to make a lot of sense when you read the Word of God and when you view your Christian walk according to God's male perspective. Now, when we're talking about a male perspective, again, don't think of discrimination or men have it better, or men have it easier. Um, men, 
when you look at a male perspective, it's going to have costs and negative things too. For example, he has to take accountability for the fall, and it's not the woman. Another example is regarding the man is he's supposed to give sacrifice to shed love towards someone or something that he loves. Uh, the Bible doesn't really say that much about the woman. The woman is more of following, but the man is more of sacrificing. See, so uh, you have to understand that just because uh, there's a male perspective within the Word of God, this doesn't mean that it all leans toward the men's favor. A lot of times it's unfavorable things that men do not like either. And trust me, that book has plenty of negative things to say about mankind. That's why anthropology is the study of man. That's what it means. If you look up the, if you trace the word anthropo anthropology, it traces down more so to a male perspective. So we have to understand and establish this fact first. So God, how did he create man? Out of the dust of the earth and his breath. The Bible says Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Another thing to note is Mark chapter 10, verse 6. Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. So God used these elements, the dust of the ground and his breath, to create man, which is why you can see a lot of commonality with God's nature, God's creation, and the human body. So Richard Dawkins thinks that when you... Uh, look at all the DNA within all of nature and God's creation because you see commonalities that proves that we evolved from a plant, a rock, and even monkeys and throughout a long process of time to how we are today. No, that's ridiculous. The Lord used nature itself to create man instantaneously. That's what he did. It didn't prove that we evolved from them. It proved more that God used those elements to create us. Notice in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, the Bible demands that within God's creation, it, there is no evolution. Verse 6, Mark 10, verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, notice God made them male and female. There is no evolution involved, you'll notice. You can also write down Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, the Bible will point out again, from the beginning, God what? Made. See that? Now, what does that mean? That means intelligent design. So I don't know why people are against that. Even Christians nowadays are against intelligent design. They say, well, that's not true. It, the Lord used evolution where we are able to become what we are today. No, that verse says, from the beginning... God made, see that? That's an act of creation all the way from the beginning. So there is no long process of time where evolution does its work. No, ever since from the beginning, there's an act of creation. There's an act of design. There's an act of intelligent design. So that's what the verse will point out. The Bible says that God created man from the dust of the ground with his very own act of creation, not process of evolution, mankind came to be. Notice this has nothing to do with evolution, but evolutionists conflate the two. They try to Combine the two together to show a connection or a relationship, ancestry. They got it wrong. It's more so an act of creation. If we look at Genesis chapter 2 again, and then verse 22... Notice God created woman out of the rib of man. 
That's how God created woman. So if women are wondering how they were created, it's not like man, an instant act of creation where God used the dust of the ground. Women, how they were created was from man himself. That's how important man is. You might say, how important is man? Then you women wouldn't exist. This is not to be mean or discriminatory, but to show the importance of that gender to God. Man is so important to God that you women came to exist because of him. So you have to understand that fact. That's just God's preference. That's just how God created things. If we look at Genesis 2 and then verse 22, the Bible points out, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's talk about God created man in his own image. God created man in his own image. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There are two more verses that I want you to write down, but we won't look at there for time's sake. But two more verses to write down is Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1 through 3. This part's going to be important, otherwise you're going to miss out this doctrine. There's an important doctrine you have to understand, is that man was originally created in the image of God, but man lost the image of God. The lie that you're going to hear from the world is that everybody's created in the image of God. Everyone is in the image of God. No, that's not true. Mankind was, but now is not. And the reason why is because of sin. Now, in order to prove this line of thought, you have to go scripture with scripture to understand. So first, let's establish this. Step by step, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Notice who is the image of God. It says Christ, who is the image of God, correct? Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. Now, when you look at those other two verses that I pointed out, Colossians 1, 15, and Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, the image of God is the same thing as the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 pointed out Christ who is the image of God. So that is not far-fetched to say. It is actually the truth that the image of God is the same thing as the image of Christ. If that is the case, then notice how do you get the image of Christ? Well, it's God created us that way when he created Adam. So we all have the image of Christ. No, what you're going to find out is that lost people currently do not have the image of Christ. So that means that even though originally we were created in the image of God, originally we were created in the image of Christ, something happened where we lost it. That's what it would mean. So in order to prove this line of thought, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 45. Before we continue on with this line of thought, here are additional nuggets that you want to keep in mind on the importance of man. Well, ah, man, this is such a male teaching. I, I hate this message. Well, it's from the Word of God. It's what God thinks. If what God thinks is important, I think we should take it as important. As a matter of fact, it might be helpful to you if you understand uh, his male perspective. Perhaps, ladies, you might understand more about your husbands, the reason why they are the way that they think, the way that they behave. 
I know that uh, ladies will not like that, but trust me, the ladies, they can tend to be more empathetic. They tend to be more considerate. They can use their brains better than the men. <laughs> men are such inconsiderate brutes. <laughs> we can be considerate, don't get me wrong, and we should, but uh, you ladies have something where you're better than us in that. So take, use that to your advantage and then understand why we are the way that we are. What might help you with that in your relationship with your husband if, is if you understand God's male thinking, God's male behavior, God's male perspective. What you have to understand is Christianity is not a female movement. Christianity is a male militant movement. Do you notice what's happening in churches? It's getting more feminized. It's more of a feeling thing. That's why they give up easily. They cry easily. They whine easily. That's why they, they act like sissies nowadays. What that has done is that it made the male weak and it made the females hyper-feminine. <laughs> you don't want that. What both male and female need is more strength. And if we can all agree in something, if we want our nation, even nation society, business, and life to be successful, you need a lot of strength. You need a lot of strength. Okay, if we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, notice this importance of male, this importance of Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. We saw that at Genesis 2. He was made a living soul by the breath of God and the dust of the ground. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That's referring to Jesus Christ because of verse 47. If you look at verse 47, that's Jesus Christ. Notice that he's called the last Adam. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What's the point here? The point is, one, how important male is to God, that Christ identified himself with Adam, not with Eve. The second thing that's important is notice that if you, if you agree man was made in the image of God, notice that Adam, who is the image of God, Jesus Christ called himself the last Adam. So Christ is equated with Adam, who is in the image of God. That's the bottom line. So Christ cannot be separated from that. That's the bottom line. Now look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Notice this male importance again. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is... Now look at this. Man is the what? Image and glory of God, right? But the woman... See that? Contrasting the man. But the woman is the what? Glory of the man. Did you notice that there? That glory is referring to what? Image and glory, right? That's all same context there. What's the verse pointing out here? The verse is pointing out that woman is not in the image and glory of God. She's in the image and glory of man. That's important to understand. Well, I don't believe in that. No, you are made from man's image, man's shape. The evidence is God took you out of the image of man, his rib, a piece of himself. So this is very plain in the scripture. That's how important man is to God. This is not trying to make us men feel better than women. That's not the bottom line. The whole bottom line is both male and female have to understand how important this gender is to God. That's the whole bottom line. It's not to elevate uh, husbands. It's not to elevate male in general to a high position and make them feel good. It's more so of valuing, understanding, recognize the importance of that gender. All right, let's look at uh, verse 4 through 5 of 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 4 through 5 of 1 Corinthians 11. Notice that this is referring to saved people, not unsaved people, correct? These are men and women praying, prophesying. 
So these are saved Christians. So the context here of 1 Corinthians 11 about man is the image, woman is the glory, it's going to be in the context of saved men, saved women, to avoid confusion. Let's look at Genesis 5, Genesis chapter 5. And then we'll look at verse 3. What happened after the fall? Now, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, will point out after the Garden of Eden, after the fall, after mankind sinned. Notice it's no longer in the image of God. Notice that when humans are born from Adam, in verse 3, Genesis 5, 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son, what? In his own likeness, after his image. It never said after the image of God. It says after man's image. What does that mean? That means no longer humankind is in the image of God. Humankind that was born after Adam don't have the image of God. They have the image of man instead. Colossians chapter th uh, 3, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. So how do you get the image of God or the image of Christ? Well, you got to get saved in Jesus Christ. That's a simple answer. Until you get saved in Jesus Christ, you can get the image of God back. Notice Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. The Bible says, And have put on the new man. So that's referring to your spiritual nature, right? So if you're a saved Christian, you have a spiritual nature. If you're not a saved Christian, you don't have a saved spiritual nature in you. Notice that the spiritual nature in verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after what? The image of him that created him. God who created mankind from his image is able to enact it, activate his image within mankind if he has a saved spiritual nature there. Do we understand that? So, until you're saved, you're in the image of God. That's why notice right here, the image of God is within you. It's not your outward flesh. This is just body. This is certainly not in the image of God. I mean, think about it. You think that uh, God would damn his image in hell for all eternity? That don't make sense. Why are saved Christians called the body of Christ? Saved people. Because that's Christ's body, Christ's image. We become a part of him. So that body of Christ, that image, is spiritual. It's not physical. It's all spiritual in here. That's the image of God within if you get saved in Jesus Christ. Okay, if you want the image of God, uh, image of God within you, the bottom, of, the bottom line is get saved. It's that simple. When we look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, that's why God, he takes murder very seriously. Now, we live in a day and age where we're avoiding capital punishment, the death penalty. I do not believe in avoiding that. I believe in capital punishment. I believe in the death penalty. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because uh, blood must be shed for blood. God, he takes that seriously. That's his own logic, blood for blood. When people don't do blood for blood, then you get rid of that balance. Justice means fairness. But our justice system is now very flawed. It doesn't do that anymore. If we go to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, the Bible says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. See, that's balanced justice. That's balance. That's equal. Why is that? The reason is for in the image of God made he man. You notice that past tense? 
So the past tense is pointing out that back in the past, God originally made mankind in his image. So because of that past creation, even though mankind lost God's image, for the sake of what he did at the past, God says the life of a human being is very important because it reminds me of what I originally created him for, to be my image. That's why if you kill a, kill a fellow human being, what God sees that as is you're killing his image, even though that man doesn't currently have the image of God. The reason why is because God, it's reminding him of his past, how he created mankind. So think about it, even though there's a bunch of human beings that don't have God's image right now, he can't help but see what he created, right? So it reminds him. So every time there's wicked people out there, I mean, this is a wicked, sick world we live in. I mean, uh, I, I know of family members and friends who got involved with uh, being attorneys and, trying, and getting involved in criminal, cr criminal justice, and it's a very sick world we live in. I mean, the pictures, documentation, it's just horrible. It ain't pretty like TV is trying to display and show you. Ain't that pretty? It is an ugly, sick world that we live in. And life must be, uh, if you take away a life, life must be paid for that one. You might say, why? That way he doesn't cause problems in the future again. Some people say that, well, if you imprison them for life, then that's better because the penalty is more severe and stuff like that. Well, the thing is this, is that there are a bunch of mafia bosses, criminals who are in uh, prison that can still carry on their crimes. <laughs> you want to end the problem? Get rid of the problem. <laughs> but we live in a day and age where the crime is carried on and blood is continually being shed. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 23. I mean, you know how sick our world is? Because we feel bad for uh, people in prison and saying that the death penalty is too cruel. Well, uh, your mind has gotten so much sick to a point that you have no compassion or empathy for babies. That's how sick your mind is. That if the doctor took up, I mean, uh, women, they're not willing to look at the bodies of the baby once those babies are taken out of their stomachs. They're not willing to look at uh, a screen of what's inside their belly. They don't want to look at all that. You, 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 I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not being mean here. I'm trying to open your eyes here that our mind is really distorted. It's really distorted that we cause, we, we give more empathy for those who commit crimes than for those who have not even committed a single crime yet. <laughs> All right, so let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when God created mankind, we've discovered, one, he created man. How he created him. Instant act of creation. How he was formed. The second thing is God created man in his own image. So we've discovered the importance of how to receive the image and the value and the importance of the male image. The third thing is that God created man with a tripartite being. God created man with a tripartite being. What in the world is that? A tripartite being, what that is, is that God created you in that verse, notice body, and then he also created soul, and then he also created spirit. There are some, not all, but perhaps all, I don't know, but I do know of some out there where Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in these three parts. You might say, I didn't know that. So now it's important for you to understand. God sees three separate parts in you. 
It's body, soul, and spirit. Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses don't think that they're separated. They think soul and spirit is the same thing. But then in this passage, you'll notice right here, God separates the three. He says spirit and soul and body. As a matter of fact, some carry it so far that they connect body to the soul. That's how bad it is. No, they're three separate things. If we continue on in the passage, if we go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we can see how these three parts were created. So let's go back to how God created man. Now God, He is a trinity, three parts, right? Amen. So He is God the Son, Jesus Christ, which is body. God the Father, there's your soul, the real you, the real person. And then uh, the, probably the most important two. And then the third is the Holy Spirit, which is obviously spirit. It would make sense if mankind was created in the image of God, they would have the similarity of having three parts too, body, soul, and spirit. So notice how God created and put those three parts in Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's your scientific uh, bodily elements that Richard Dawkins and evolutionists think that there's a commonality and ancestry. That's our biological form that we were created from. That's our body. And breathe, see, breathe into his nostrils. Spirit means breath, wind. So that's where you get your spirit. The breath of life and man became a living soul. There's your soul, the real you, the real person. That's a result from it. We're going to also look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Now, this is not intended to be, but it just happened to be so. But this, you'll notice this is a very anti-liberal message. <laughs> so if you're a liberal, you may not like this message. However, you have to understand this. It's not a matter of your own personal belief. I mean, Republicans have their problem too. Republicans have the problem. So it's not a matter of conservatism or liberalism. The matter is, what does the Bible say? Do you believe the Bible? So you have to believe in the Bible or believe in your personal belief. Now, the Word of God also gives another anti-liberal statement where God created man with control of the environment. God created man with control of the environment. Environment does not control us, but we live in a day and age where we make nature control us, where we have the environment control us. We prioritize more on the environment than man. That's how bad it is. Now look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and share it. Is that what it said? And have and share with the fish of the sea, and share with the fowl of the air, and share with every living thing that moveth upon the earth. No, it says dominion. It says subdue. That means to control. Now, that doesn't mean abuse. No, I'm not saying to abuse the environment. When you want to manage, see? If you're in charge over something, you don't want to abuse it and waste all your resources. See that? If you're in charge and in control of something, you want to use it well. But that doesn't mean that you become weak or you lose control. We live in a day and age now where tax money is just crazy in its spending. We live in a day and age where people, they just feel guilty in cutting down a tree. We live in a day and age where people prioritize animals more than their own family. I mean, there was a woman who tried to avoid an animal uh, when she was uh, driving, but then what happened is that she killed her own children consequently. It's become an instinct nowadays that uh, we put animals and we put the nature as a high priority more than, our, more than fellow humans. 
And if you don't believe so, then abortion should be the evidence of that one and uh, other things. But anyway, we have to realize that mankind, for them to survive, for them to continue, is to what? Is to, get this, this might sound liberal to you, it's to manage their environment well, <laughs> which is what the liberals have always touted, right? But see, the liberals tout the management of the environment of what? We all share with each other. See, it's all sharing authority. No, that's not how it works. You ha if, I mean, let's just be honest, all right? Everybody who wants to talk about saving cows, sheep, goats, and chickens, and cockroaches, of course, I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean, all right? Hey, we got to be fair, right? You can't pick a dog. You can't pick your favorite animal or rare species. I mean, do the same thing. What about cockroaches? Come on, okay, but anyway, I mean, people who tout like that, they're big hypocrites because they pick and choose what animals they like. Right. So that shows me that's, uh, that's like a bunch of Nazis right there. They prefer a race that they choose that's superior to their preference. Another thing is uh, they're hypocrites because uh, they're wearing the items or they're eating the items yep. that they're protecting, okay? So I don't believe in that, okay? Everybody... Whether you, I don't care how extreme of a liberal you are, you will have dominion, dominion over nature or over an animal in some way. Why? Because that's your survival. That's your survival. All right, let's uh, look at uh, Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Well, uh, I get it that in Genesis 1... Mankind had control over the environment, but now that we have the fall and the earth is dying, Adam sinned, and the environment is uh, fading away, that's different now. So we got to share the environment and we got to protect the environment. And then, well, no, it's the same thing. You're still supposed to have control. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3 through 4. Genesis 9, 3 through 4. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, <coughs> but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So notice right here that God, he continues. Uh, if you look at verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, and to your hand are they delivered. That's a lot of control, that they even fear you. Well, I don't believe in animals fearing me. I got to share, get along, and we can co-inhabit with each other, each other. No, you don't. Then you're like, that, you're like that fool who got along with every animal. I forgot his name. And then he swam with the stingray, and then he got killed by a stingray. I don't care how much you pet the stingray or how much you feed the stingray or how much you get along with the stingray. The instinct is in there where there's a fear factor. And everyone is survival mode. That's human nature. Besides, I thought that's evolution. Survival. You, you, you see the distortion of our thinking? Look, I, know, I went to liberal school. I know all the arguments. I know all the stuff. But people don't, in, don't look at the Bible's arguments. And then you'll realize it's so distorted what we've been taught in our schools nowadays. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll look at verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 16. Another thing is God created man uh, with free will. God created man uh, with free will. Uh, let me show you a chart here. So here's a chart on how free will works. Uh, we have free will, and then they'll say about compatibilism, libertarianism, hard determinism, hard in indeterminism. Reality is indetermined. Reality is determined. Blah, 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 blah. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a philosophical mess nowadays. Such a philosophical mess nowadays. But let's be simple from the Word of God. God created man with free will. That's it. <laughs> If you look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, 
The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest what? Free. Freely eat. So God created man with the free choice to sin against him. Calvinism teaches that God, he does not give you free will, but that he elects or he forces you to make a choice. Well, then that's just wicked that people who do not believe in Jesus Christ and who burn in hell or who sin against God, that God made them do that. That doesn't make sense. God gives free will to everybody. The Bible says in verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, did not God give a decree right here? That's a decree. Don't Calvinists believe when God decrees something, he is sovereign and it must be so and it has to be so? Well, notice right here, God's decree was violated by man's free will. Well, that, uh, you're saying that man's free will is stronger than the decree of God? Don't give me that philosophical garbage. Let's make it simple. Verse 16 and 17 showed you God made a decree and mankind had the free choice to violate it. It's not a matter of what's more powerful, God's decree or man's free will. God is weaker than man and you're saying man is stronger than God. No, it's what God ordained if he's sovereign. You know what he ordained? I give you free choice. And when I give a decree, you have a free choice to violate it or to follow it. Ain't that simple? Calvinist PhD scholar you? Why do you have to trap us with these questions? <laughs> okay, let's look at John, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And then we'll look at verse 15. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. I despise philosophy. I despise scholars trying to make everything complicated when truth is more simple than you think. So I love taking their complicated arguments and simplifying it to make it look foolishness in the eyes of the Lord. I just love doing that because that's what it is. You deceive so many people with complications. If there's one thing you're going to notice from me, I don't believe in that. I'm not going to use long vocabulary words or complicated logic to confuse you and then make you think that I'm smarter than you or that uh, I'm intelligent and that if you don't follow like what I believe, then you're not intelligent through this uh, jargon and scholastic lingo. I'm not going to do that with you. I'm going to be real with you, honest with you. I believe in that. If you want the truth, you should get it honestly. You should get it to your understanding. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. See that? You have a choice. You have a choice to make that God gives to you. All right, let's look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. There are times that the will of God can overpower the will of man. So there are verses on that. Don't get me wrong. I can agree with that. But there are times that... The will of man can overpower the will of God. Why? Because God likes it that way. <laughs> God likes it that way. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. He wants mankind to have a free choice to make. He doesn't like it when he forces them to everything to his preference. Look at 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing. So God is not willing. That's his will. That any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not will for people to burn in hell. God's will is that everybody repents. Well, guess what? Not everybody repents, do they? Their will is not to repent. So notice right here, it overpowered the will of God. Let's look at Genesis 2. Verse 19, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. Several things we have learned so far from mankind is that now they have a free will. So their heart is their own. And 
God's not going to force their heart to do something. Another thing is obviously he has intellect. He has intelligence. Now we live in a day and age, don't get me wrong, I, as you've noticed from me, I don't like intellectualism, it just makes me upset, but that doesn't mean that I approve of being dumb either. We live in a day and age where people are not studying. We live in a day and age where people are not using their intelligence. And that's the reason why people who are more intelligent than you will use intelligent jargon, intelligent logic to control you, to deceive you. Do you understand that? So I'm not, against intel I'm not against intellectualism in the sense of not growing in knowledge. It's important that you do. That way you don't get fooled by people out there. Amen. We live in a day and age where churches are not studying. They're not growing. It's more of entertainment. You notice that? That's why a lot of people are falling away from churches and falling into the ways that the colleges teach them. You know why? Because colleges are studying. Churches aren't. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Now do you know why we have Bible study? This is the only intelligent thing you probably heard all week long that's related to the Bible. When's the last time you had an intelligent or you were getting into intelligence or some form of studying the Bible? When's the last time? That's why it's important not to just come to Sunday main service for preaching. You need something to get in your head and learn. Okay. You need to write down notes. You need to grow in knowledge. Genesis 2, verse 19. The Bible says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. Now, that takes a lot of intelligence where Adam is able to name all the animals and remember them. And if you don't think so, well, no, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence. I can do that too. Then you study, then you study biology. You, st you become a biologist. And tell me if you remember all those names and terms. Come on. That, it obviously takes a lot of intelligence. You don't even uh, know all the names in your very own body. Okay. You don't know all the names in your own body. All right, let's look at uh, Genesis 2, verse 17. Notice that man has the intelligence to know good and evil. He has the intelligence to know good and evil. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. The Bible says, Above the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, obviously, we know that mankind ate that tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So because of that, that's why we now have knowledge of good and evil. So that is our uh, intellect now. That is our thinking now. We now know and we can now distinguish what is right and what is wrong because we all partook in the fruit a long time ago. Now let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Another form of intellect is spiritual things after salvation. Spiritual things after salvation. So if all of you are saved, then how much are you growing in knowledge of spiritual things? If you know more about the things that you learned in your job, your business, or in your school, or your background, or if you know more about what you watched in TV or in sports, that's pretty bad, don't you think so? If, you, if that is a lot more than the spiritual things. So let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in what? Knowledge. Knowledge, after the image of him that created him. So the new man is your spiritual nature. You're supposed to have more knowledge of spiritual things. So you are created and made with intellect. You might say, well, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I just don't know much Bible, and et cetera, et cetera. N nobody has an excuse. Nobody has an excuse. 
Mankind is created with the ability to think. If you can think, you can put some form of knowledge in there. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. God created man with fellow men. That's another thing to understand. God created man with fellow men. So you see this chart? God did not just create it like this. God also created this. Now the problem nowadays with saved Christians is that they think that they're their own island. No, you're not your own island. You need people. That's why we emphasize the importance of a local church like this. We all need to meet together. You, must, you might say, well, I don't need people. Well, you might think so, but that's not how God created you to be. God created you to have socializing, to encounter people. Now, look, uh, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm, I hate socializing too, all right? I'm not a social person. I just don't like that. I like to be by myself. Ask my wife. <laughs> yeah, now y'all got it, right? <laughs> now y'all got it, right? But if I'm going to make our marriage better, what do I got to do? I got to work on my socializing. Same thing as a pastor. If I'm going to be a good pastor, I got to socialize. I can't expect people to come to church. Well, why isn't anybody coming to my church? Because you're not reaching out to them. So you have to have a social encounter. That's what we're created and made to be. All right, look at Genesis 2, verse 18. The Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. So see, even God says it's not good to be alone. Not just one person not just a wife. That's not just the context. He wants a lot of people. That's how God created mankind to have. He wants a lot of people. So go to Genesis 1, 28. Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. See that? And replenish the earth. So he wants more human beings. More human beings. Now, this is not to say that we're supposed to keep reproducing babies and then overpopulate the world. I mean, we've already pretty much populated the whole world, right? But isn't it interesting that with this mass amount of population, there are so many people who feel more lonely in cities? So obviously, this, this idea that I'm talking about is not populating, okay? Because you can still feel lonely through reproduction and populating. The point of this is that it's good to have social encounters with a lot of people. The more you have that, the more healthy it is. Yeah. Think about it. If you want to witness to souls, how are you going to do that without socializing with them? Okay. We got people in our church who are super duper bad in socializing. Some of them even have a serious problem with socializing. Genuine serious problem. But that doesn't prevent them from witnessing or socializing. Amen. That doesn't stop them. Why? Because we are made, created to do that, even if you think that you are totally non-social, anti-social, unsocial, etc. You need that. You need that. Amen. Let's uh, look at Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. You might say, why do I need that? Because it's healthy for you. The more you uh, encounter people, the more your perspectives change. The more your mood changes. The more you receive help from people. I mean, it's, it's, if you want to survive, social relationships are so important even. Think about business. You know what's so important for businesses to exceed? A lot of business partners. What does that mean, partner? A lot of socializing encounters. I mean, it's so... It's so important that in Korea, they force, uh, or they force their workers to drink when they socialize with other co-workers. Why? Because they believe in socializing that much, so that you get drunk and then you're all socializing more easily. Now, uh, what are you learning from today's lesson? Go get drunk and socialize with people and win them to Jesus Christ. Uh, go ahead. All right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. 
No, no, no. Okay, please, just in case, all right? <laughs> in case some of you misunderstood. All right, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. <laughs> the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as he see the day approaching. Now, see this is that the verse says to say, believers, whenever we assemble, so we call it an assembly, right? A church. Yeah. So whenever we assemble, we're not supposed to forsake it. God forbids forsaking attending church. People want a verse on that? That's the verse. Amen. But it's more than just church attendance. Yeah. It says whenever we assemble. So that's why it's important not to pick and choose services or certain fellowships you want. You got to try to attend every one of them. Because why? You need it even if you don't feel like you need it. Because God created with that within us. There's a need there. <clears throat> I want you to go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And we'll look at verse 11. Now God, he desires men to live forever for his personal joy. He desires men to live forever for his personal joy. The last part we're going to cover is God created man with immortality. God created man with immortality. Man is made to live forever. And obviously we know that we're not going to live forever. Rich people are trying to do that with the best medicine, science, and whatever they donate, and some weird experiments going on, which is a real thing. It's a real thing going on. But there are people who try to live forever, but they cannot live forever. And we obviously know why, because of sin. But God originally created us to live forever. Why? Because God lives forever. And because he lives forever, he wants the fellowship. He obviously cannot do that by himself, right? So because he wants fellowship, that's why he created you. And because he lives forever, for the fellowship to be forever, he needs you to be forever. So it's for his own personal joy. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, the Bible says, I'm at chapter 6, sorry. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. So when he created all of nature, and including mankind, for thy pleasure they are and were created. See, it's for his personal joy. That's why God created you to live forever. But obviously, people don't live forever. Why is that? The reason why people don't live forever, we know that people have sinned against God. So again, you need to get saved. So go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. If you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you gain immortality. You gain eternal life. Uh, you know, powerful people, they're trying to live forever through the most expensive money, through all their sacrifices, finding the best doctors, best scientists, taking all sorts of medication. They even put painful things in their body just to live longer. That's what money does. That's what the world does without Jesus Christ. But all you have to do is just within 15 seconds receive Christ for your salvation. Amen. That's how you live forever. Yeah. Ain't that something? Right. So Romans chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and what? Immortality, etern eternal life. Now, there are three things that you want to know about <clears throat> that will help you live forever because you have three parts, right? If you have three parts and you're going to live forever, that means these three parts have to be forever. So let's cover how you can get these three to live forever. And it's not science, not medication, it's not all the yoga and new age stuff in the world, it's not reincarnation. Notice people, they, they, they're seeking for eternal life. You notice that? Everybody. 
through scientific experiments or through uh, new age stuff, religious means, spiritualism stuff. They're all trying to live forever through all these three parts. But let me tell you how you can get that. So first of all is the spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Write that down because we don't have time. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. The Bible says the spirit goes to God. So because the spirit goes to God and you're going to obviously be one with God after you die, that's how you live forever in your spirit. Second one is the soul, the soul. Write down Matthew 25, 46. Matthew 25, 46. The soul goes to heaven, and obviously, that's why you live forever. You're going to be in heaven with God where there is no death nor sorrow. And then the last one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 53 through 54. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53 through 54. The body will get a resurrection, resurrection. That's how it's going to live forever because you're going, your body, which is dying, will die. Resurrection means something must die to be resurrected. That's right. yeah. So you have to accept death. You have to let the body fade away and die. That's why we Christians aren't worried about death Amen. because we know we're going to live forever, even in our body one day. It's called a resurrection. Uh, you'll notice right here that the last chart that I want to show you is how mankind need fellowship with one another. And you'll notice witnessing is a part of socializing, growing in the spirit, getting into the word of God, and encountering uh, fellow believers. All of that is important. Socializing is important. God did not create mankind to be alone. And in summarizing... With this final section that God created man with immortality, God sees how being alone is not a good thing. Being with others is so important, which is why God created you to have eternal life where, with him where he can always have the fellowship with you and there is no loneliness with us nor with God. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers that they grow more in knowledge of the scriptures and understood more of right doctrine and truth in the midst of a world where there's so many wrong teachings. Thank you for how you created us, how you made us. Now let us take those things as important and not distort how you created us. Not distort or misuse or abuse the way that you created us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. If there's someone you did not say hi to, please say hi to those people. Don't worry. They'll say hi.